this yellow screen. And here we are, we're live. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. And yes, I know I am really squished. I had to restart my computer and I'm not this squished. Um, John looks great and normal, but not me, so you'll just have to deal with me a little bit. And my chat's not working, so and I'm getting a new computer. So anyway, good to see everybody. Um, let us know you're here. Click in the attendees, uh, type something and say hey and let us know you're there. So anyway, we're going to get started. I have John Clifford on today and I'm real excited about having him on because he has written a book that I really like. And I actually use this as my book, one of my course books in my intro to graphic design. And this is the book. It's called Graphic Icons. And one thing I love is that it um, it takes really some great designers and puts it into a really concise, we're not seeing everything Paul Rand did or everything Saul Bass did, but we're getting kind of a good overview. And then it gives us, it's like an appetizer. And then we get to get dig deeper. So I really like it, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about. But John also is a designer and has done a ton of, design work that's really cool, so we're going to talk about that too. So, John, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Diane. It's good to be here. All right, so we're going to just jump in. So tell us a little bit about your design history, your work history maybe, and how you um, fell in love for with design, and then maybe how you fell in love with design history. Sure. Um, I had started, um, design is a second career for me. I had after college, I'd worked in marketing in the music industry, um, which is really fun. Um, but then after a while, I kind of uh, knew I wanted to do something more creative. And I went back to school to study design sort of on a gut feeling. I had no art background, um, no design background, and I was, um, I was horrible. I was uh, one of the worst <laughs> students in my program. And it, it was tough. It was a struggle. Um, and... I guess it was maybe my second semester. I took a graphic design history class, and um, that was a really important class for me. Um, at the time, this was way back in the 1990s, so the whole you know grunge thing was popular. Everything was kind of distressed and lots of layers and very complex. And I was always more about clarity and simplicity, but everybody else seemed to be doing this this you know complex thing that looked really cool. But I just thought I couldn't do it. I didn't know how to do it. And then once I saw, started seeing people like Ella Zitsky and Herbert Beyer and some of these people from history that were doing things that were um, simple and stark yet really bold and really exciting, I thought, like, okay, maybe there's a place for me in this design world. And, and that's when I feel like I kind of started to get my footing in design. So, um, um, so that was, I think, an important... Um, an important class for me and something that I've, I've continued to be interested in as I've been a designer. Definitely. All right, so you made this book, and I know you described the book in the beginning of the book. You have a little intro, and you describe it as being made up of the people that have influenced you the most. And it kind of is also this primer. And um, I'm a Phil Meggs student, so I am all about Phil and keeping his legacy. So, you know, um, when somebody does a design history, you know, you always kind of wonder, oh my gosh, are they trying to replace, you know, the history of graphic design by Phil Meggs? And of course, me being a student, I always want to lead the charge. Um, and you even say that, that this isn't something that you're trying to replace, that this is just kind of like a, a taste, a teaser, so that people can hopefully get go in and get a little deeper. Um, do you want to elaborate a little on that? I know that's not our question, but... Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted. Um, and I'd love to hear um, about your experience with Phil Meggs. I mean, I, I know the book very well, obviously. Um, I never um, knew him personally. would love to hear um, how um, he was as a teacher. Um, do you want to oh. talk about that now? <laughs> he was a great teacher. Me and you can talk about that later if okay. you want. I don't know if anybody okay. wants to hear that. But um, Phil never – I honestly believe Phil um, – was so humble, and he was one of those guys that would say, oh, you've heard of me? And he was being serious. Oh. And 
uh, Rob Carter was one of my teachers and Ben Day and so and they all were great and they're uh, totally different designers but they all were amazing to learn from and but that was I remember Phil saying that the first time I met him I'm like yeah you wrote all my textbooks I know who you are but he was he was really really humble and really funny um, and he passed away when I was at VCU so it was um, super sad but he was he was it left such a great legacy and I think he did and I think that your book will serve that same kind of because I think that big is intimidating. That book is intimidating for a lot of people because it's really big, mm -hmm. and your book is much more. See, I, I've claimed it as mine. Um, it's much more easy to take in, and you do use a lot of great white space. So there's all kinds of white space in there, and you you know you design super well. So it doesn't feel like I'm having to take this massive thing and I also can carry it a little bit easier than I could carry the history of graphic design so exactly and that's um, you know the the Meg's book is is such an amazing book and it's so um, in depth and it's it's kind of you know it, that is the classic design history book and um, there's no messing with that as far as I'm concerned and um, what I wanted was something that um, you know was that like you said sort of the introduction um, something that where the big book might scare somebody away, maybe this little book <laughs> might, you know, sort of invite somebody in, and if they're interested, then they can then move on to the Maggie's book. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I also think that there are a lot of people who, who work in design and maybe come from, you know, they might come from a programming background or they might come from a different kind of background and just sort of ended up in design um, without that formal design education. Um, so I think that, um, you know, if this can help some people who are in that situation to learn, learn a little bit about the history, um, that would be great, you know, where I think that, like you said, the, the next book can be intimidating, that somebody who is busy and overwhelmed as it is might not pick up this giant book, but maybe they could pick up my, my little book. And not that it's <laughs> little, but you know what I mean. It's, it's much more digestible. Yes. And, and I th and I'm using it in the intro to graphic design and and hopefully I think that if you eat good visually you will produce better visually and I think that you give a lot of good little snack pieces for people to kind of look at and see what was working and I think simple design comes out in in so many of the people who've influenced you and who are in the book but it's also it has nothing to do, to me it has nothing to do with complexity because the the con the concepts and conceptually they're very complex. Um, a lot of the designs, and I think that's one of the great things that you've you've been able to pull out mm -hmm. in the book. Oh, thanks. I think it's also like what I liked to do in the book. Like throughout the book, I'll sprinkle these little things. You know, if if you're uh, say if if you're interested in Saul Bass's work, you might also want to check out these other film title designers, or you might want to read this other book, or you might want to see this documentary on Herbert Motter, or right. you know, I just um, I just always kind of want to lead people um, to other things because there's only sort of so much that I could do with um, with that book, but hopefully can um, get people um, learning more about design. Definitely, definitely for sure. So. This is the question for that um, last one that I, it was a long intro, I guess, but did hi, you also teach um, the history of graphic design as well as some other classes at the college level. Does teaching history of graphic design, did that inspire you to write this or did you see people that needed an introduction, like they were from professional industry and then you just wanted to kind of get them hooked or, or why write the book? Yeah, the the teaching came later. I, I was not teaching history before I wrote the book. So um, um, I had taught other classes before um, I wrote the book. But um, the book was something that I think I always wanted for myself. Mm. Um, I always wanted something that was sort of an easy reference, even though I'm, you know, I've um, I've studied this stuff and I kind of know it. I wanted something that was easy to be like, oh yeah, maybe I. Could head in this kind of direction and um, have some some easy visual reference, um, but I also thought it was a good you know just to give somebody an introduction who maybe is considering design or is just starting design or has kind of found themselves in the design world. Um, but I think that um, um, 
you know, I always sort of figured that somebody else would write the book. It sort of seemed like, you know, there should be a book like this and figured, you know, Stephen Heller is going to write this book. Right. Um, and uh, he didn't. And and so after a while, I thought, like, well, maybe I should actually try this. And um, so I started working on it and, um, and actually did it. <laughs> so how did you decide who to include? And... I mean, because to me, you have amazing designers in there, but I'm sure that there, are, and you didn't even talk about like Tibor Kalman, you wanted to have him in, but couldn't get permissions and stuff. I mean, had you ever written a book before this? No, no, this is my first book, um, and uh, and it was it was definitely a big challenge. And on, on <laughs> is several... it your last? I hope <laughs> yeah, <not>. <laughs> maybe my last. <laughs> it might be one of those things that okay, I did it once. That's enough. <laughs> It's kind of like going to Vegas. <laughs> I may not need to go again. Um, uh, it's um, yeah, yeah. Picking people was, um, you know, I think the people that ended up in the book were the people that I really wanted. Um, there are a few more that would have been nice, like you mentioned, Tibor Kalman. You know, very influential. Several people who I talked to in the book mention him as an influence. Um, so I really did want to show his work as well, and just was not able to get permission. It's, it's permission was, uh, you know, that's a big pain in doing a book like this. Right. Um, Massimo Vignelli, another amazing designer who I really wanted in the book. Um, I I couldn't get permission, so um, so he's not there. Um, but uh, you know, I hope that people will check these people out as well. Um, but I think that I'm I'm thrilled with who I was able to get. You know, it's sort of you start this and you think like, well, maybe nobody will return my calls or emails, and um, you know, maybe maybe I'll end up getting you know, this will just be ten designers that I can do. But so I'm um, I'm thrilled with the people that I was able to get in this book. So not having written a book, I can see that that could be another hurdle that you had to kind of get across. Like, hey, I, I really am. You know, I'm not just like some Joe off the street. I'm gonna write this book, and I have a publisher. And I mean, you, it's it's with a great press. It's Pearson, and so I mean, that's a we use Pearson books all the time, and they're they're good, and it's color, and you get to see lots of pictures, and which I really like as a designer. So, what were some other of the struggles that you went through that you maybe didn't realize you would have? They wouldn't be that. You thought it, it's not going to be that big. Um, I, I never thought this was not going to be that big. <laughs> I always knew it was going to be hard, um, but uh, I think that you know, getting permissions um, and especially with some of the older stuff, like um, <coughs> pardon me, some of the you know designers who have passed away who have estates, um, often you have to pay to get permission um, and maybe pay to get an image that is usable in a book. Um, that was huge, and there was a point where it seemed like it wasn't going to be able to happen. You know, it's I had a small image budget that I could use, and um, you know, as I first started um, going through that, it seemed like okay, maybe I can put five images in this book <laughs> with with the budget that I had. So, so it took a lot of time for me, and I think kind of um, became sort of an obsession of finding ways to get images and to get permissions and to make them um, to, to fit it within my budget, which um, took a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of, I think, sort of creative thinking of like, okay, well, this sort of standard route to go through this way um, might not be my best bet, and maybe I can, um, you know, let's say just as far as getting some of the images. You know, there were a couple of guys who um, sell some stuff on Etsy, um, you know, might sell an Alvin Lustig book jacket and a Paul Rand annual report or something. And I asked if I might be able to use some of their images. Um, they were great. So, you know, that helped me get some images and then I still needed to get permission. So it was just, you know, different ways to, um, you know, approach to all sorts of people who have collections and um, different ways to get images and, Sort of plead my case with the people who um, who, who wanted to charge money to get permission. Um, so um, it ended up working. Um, so that that was huge. That was maybe like you know half half of the process. Um, 
And then writing, um, I don't know if you know this, but writing is hard. <laughs> um, it was a challenge for me. You know, I think with my design, you know, I always look at it as it needs to go through an ugly phase before it gets good. Um, and my writing, like that ugly phase was just way bigger than my ugly phase in design is, you know, where I'm way too embarrassed to show anybody the writing. So it was always... Um, tough you know you sort of I, I sort of thought the writing would get easier as I went along I'd get into a groove but it was always hard <laughs> it was always hard yeah. um, I'm not a big fan of writing either yeah I love to read but <laughs> uh, it doesn't quite go hand in hand as much as it should I guess so yeah. how did you narrow down so did you come with like a list of ideals and then you were just gonna try and see if you could get those to get permissions and get rights yeah, yeah, pretty much. And there, there were like a, um, you know, a few people um, were not on my original list that as I was researching, you know, I kind of found out about um, people that I wasn't really aware of before um, that I thought were great and were important to include in the book. Um, yeah, but it was it was kind of a master list that I think I ended up being pretty close to. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, we have some images from the book. I thought maybe we could show some of those and you can walk us through, and then um, maybe you can talk about how long it took you to, um, you know, write and uh, from concept to production. Like, when did you start? Did you start five years ago? Did you start six months ago? Things like that. Yeah. Um, as far as right, like, from concept, I think the, the concept was, you know, in my head several years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to say maybe that was over like a four-year period where I thought, you know, this should be a book and maybe I could do this someday, but somebody else will probably beat me to it. And um, <laughs> I'd sort of slowly work on that, but not getting very far. Once I got, once I decided actively to pursue it, it was, um, you know, a few months of kind of working on my writing, trying to get that better and, and working on a proposal to send out to publishers. Um, and then once I had a deal in place, then it was about a year of, um, and that was probably like six months of dealing with getting it, and then six months of writing it and designing it. And so a lot of times the books at Pearson, they'll have their own designers in house. Um, so you were able to control and design your own. So that's awesome. Was that different? I mean, I'm sure they expect some of that, but... Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I know I've... Um, I, I spoke with somebody one time who said that um, once she has gone through the really long process of writing a book, the last thing she wants to do is design it. Like, she's <laughs> right. finished with it. And I completely understand that. But at the same time, I couldn't imagine pouring so much of my heart and soul into the writing of this book and then letting somebody else design it. And then... You know, what if I was disappointed with that design? Then that would um, that would be pretty sad. And if I'm disappointed with my own design, then that's my own problem. <laughs> what if it was uh, somebody else's? You know, I think that um, I, I just would rather do it. Right. All right. Well, let's look at some of the work. Yeah. Um, Saul Bass is I'm probably he's my favorite. I think I love um, so many things about him. So I was so glad you I use this. Um, the that poster and that title sequence and stuff in as I teach so I really like I'm glad you were able to include the man with the golden arm but do you want to talk a little bit about some of these sure um, yeah Saul Bass is amazing um, and what I love about him what I always try to take from the designers in this book is not just you know I don't want I'm not looking at it as, a, as inspiration like oh I want to design something that looks like Saul Bass did it right um, what I'm more interested in is, you know, that Saul Bass, before he came along with the film titles for The Man with the Golden Arm, um, you know, film titles were nothing. And theaters often had the, the curtains closed, you know, while they were playing because they were so inconsequential. Um, I think he saw an opportunity or a need that hadn't been fulfilled and he came up with this really great way of starting the film, of setting the tone, setting the mood, 
um, starting to tell the story before the film actually began, and it became such an important part of the movie and such an important part of you know what we designers continue to do now. And I think like that kind of thinking is what I love. Like yeah, I love his, I love how his work looks, but I love how he came up with this idea that nobody was really doing anything before, and that's great. So how did you decide which pieces to include for each person? It, it, it could be a challenge. Um, with Saul Bass, you know, I knew the Man with the Golden Arm had to be there because that was sort of the first kind of um, really important title piece, um, and I love it. And um, the Vertigo, I think, is the the poster for Vertigo um, is also in the book, and that's so visual. And then I think that um, I, what I also wanted to show, and I could you know show a ton of his. Um, film title stills and or posters, but, I, you know, you sort of think of, like, what do I need to sort of tell the story? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, another great part of Saul Bass's career is his corporate identity work, and so then I was able to show several of the logos that he designed. Um, with some people, you know, I, I kind of felt like I could get the point across without showing a lot. You know, maybe one or two or three images kind of tells a story, and maybe some people need several. Um, and, and obviously, all of these people are great, so they have a ton of great work, and, you know, each each one could be their own book. So it, it is a matter of what do I need to tell the story. Well, and I think your history in publication design, because you've done publication, you've done books for other people, and that helps. That gives you an added advantage of knowing what you need to tell that story because a lot of times when I'm doing a, a story, I can't use every image the photographer sent me. You know, I have to yeah. adjust and, and really, and I think a lot of times people don't realize that you're really editing any kind of publication design you're editing. Yes, exactly. And, um, and I think that that's a great point and I think that that, um, also really applies to my writing in this case because, um, you know, yes, I had to do a lot of editing of the images. And some of that, it, to be honest, is was a practical concern. Like, I could only get my hands on one image or these were the images that I had to choose from. Um, but mostly I was able to, um, you know, in some way get what I wanted. But as far as editing goes, yes, it's, it's editing visually. And I think that um, what I was writing, you know, every the book is set up as, as little profiles of each designer and you know it's it's not a lot of text and I didn't want it to be a lot of text and there in most of the cases there's a lot of information out there on these designers and so what I saw my role as doing was how do I take all that's out there and edit it down so that people can quickly get what's important about them what they did that was new or interesting and how they contributed to the field of graphic design so you also have these little illustrations, which are great. And this is kind of like a, a this is like the beginning of a, a new chapter. Well, they're sections, but then they're each little person. Each person has a chapter. I don't want to say little person. Not that little people are bad, because I'm sort of little, but um, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, but you have these illustrations. I can't zoom in because the, you know, whatever thing doesn't work on this Google Plus thing. But... So did I mean? Because that's a lot of people you had to make illustrations for. Yes, and and I didn't create those illustrations. My friend Herb Thornby, um, who was a great designer um, and illustrator, um, he did those for me. Um, and and I think it's so great. I wanted, um, you know, the the other thing about this book was that I feel like, you know, a lot of people know some of the famous architects or artists or fashion designers and. I don't think that many people know graphic designers. Um, so I, I wanted people to know who these people are, and I think that a big help was showing their face. Like, how do we connect? How do we put a face to the, this name that we see? You know, normally we also don't, a lot of people don't know what Paul Rand looked like or, um, you know, what Joseph Miller Brockman looked like, um, even if you know their work. So, um, it, and that was another, you know, I sort of thought maybe I could get a little headshot for each person, and that was another permission <laughs> photo nightmare that I knew I couldn't do. So um, so I asked my friend Herb to help me out and draw these little headshots so that we at least get 
some sense of, of what this person looked like. And I think it's such an important way to kind of humanize these people and to yeah. connect a face to the name. That was really neat. And it was it was a small little gesture I think that you did that I think I noticed and I it made a impact on me. And it was it's small, but it's nice to see kind of what their face looked like. We're gonna flip through a couple more of the spreads and you can kind of tell us whatever you want to tell us about them and then we'll jump on to some how some of your design. Great, great. Um, yeah, you, you're looking right now at a um, uh, spread um, about C.P. Pinellas, um, who was a really, um, she was a pioneer, um, uh, you know, one of the first female art directors. Um, this is in the, I just love her story that, you know, in the 1940s, she was looking for a job and, and people loved her work when they saw her portfolio. But um, once they realized, you know, her first name is C.P. and it's an unusual name, um, people realized that she was a woman and then they lost interest, um, which, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about women in graphic design still today, but it still sounds archaic that, you know, a woman couldn't get a job. Um, but she kept at it and she became um, an art director at Glamour Magazine, which was the first time a female was... Um, an art director at a major U.S. magazine, and um, I just love her the, her whole story. You know, she had this whole um, she really kind of led by example. Like she not she the the magazine that you're seeing there, Charm magazine, was um, targeted toward working women um, in the 1950s, and which was a new demographic. And she always said how she liked to show, you know, instead of this really what she called false glamour show you know, the clothes in her fashion layouts show the clothes, you know, in use. Like, you know, people running errands, people going to work, you know, people commuting. Um, and um, she, you know, just by being a working woman, she, she designed for working women and didn't talk down to them. And she was a working woman. Like, she just was a great example, I think, for everybody. That's cool. All right, so we have some more great history design history pieces. Yeah, um, that's Ella Zitsky, and that is one of those pieces I remember seeing in my graphic design history class, and that was one of those, like, you know, after being used to so many complex layers and distortion and, and illegible type and everything, and then just seeing that and just, you know, it's so kind of stark... Um, yet so powerful, you know, that there's all this white space and there's a giant two and a red square and it's, you know, that's pretty much it. And it's so powerful and so beautiful to mm -hmm. me that um, I was just blown away when I saw that. And that it was, you know, from like 1922 or something, I think, is it's pretty great. Definitely cutting edge for 1922 and maybe cutting yeah. edge, it, especially in the 90s when you're David Carson-esque kind of type and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm with you on that. And again, I think simple use. I have a Glenn Miller album cover over on another bookshelf, and it has this sort of feel. And there's so much really cool stuff that you could do with just simple type and color. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, this was the same thing. This is one of those things that I remember from, from my history class. And this is Herbert Beyer. Um, who was both a student and a teacher at the Bauhaus. Um, and um, just that big, bold type, you know, throw a couple of colors in there, and it's this really strong piece. Um, and I just, I've just i always loved that. That's one of my favorite pieces. So, like, that one looks... Um, so where did you get that piece? How did you find... I mean, did somebody give you the, the scan? Because it seems like it's on like a I don't know it's, yeah it's, it's a book cover and it's um, uh, it's a scan or a photo I'm not sure it came from a um, uh, collection at a library at Harvard University oh nice yeah Man, do you remember where all of them came from I if I mean some of them I'd be able to pick out some of them I'd be a little confused but I, I probably remember most of them I have deal with that for so long that <laughs> I probably yeah, have a they, memory about that. <laughs> they became a, a relationship you can't yeah. forget. <laughs> um, oh, and this is C.B. Pinellas again, um, and that's, I think, an example of that, like, you know, this fashion, but showing it at work. I love the, you know, the giant typewriter keys um, there with the, the, the woman leaning on. Mm-hmm. 
And Milton Glaser, obviously, um, huge. Um, this was something that, you know, for me it was great, to, and I, I was able to include this. He was generous enough to let me include this on the cover of my book, and um, it was really fun for me. When I was a little kid, that poster was in, hanging in my basement, and I have no idea where it came from. Um, you know, I don't think my parents were Bob Dylan fans. I don't think my siblings were. I, I don't know where it came from, but I always thought it was so cool. And, you know, and when I was seeing it, it was a little later than when it was um, first out, um, but I just thought it was so cool then. And then um, once I learned more about design, I realized, like, oh, that's that's Milton Glaser. He's a famous designer. Um, and I still think it's just as cool now. It's something that has not um, fallen out of favor for me. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. And yeah. he's everything he does. I think is he's such a nice man. He's in New York, right? Yeah. Um, and now this is total '90s. This is when I was in school. I believe maybe it wasn't that, but I think of Sagmeister as being in the night. I don't remember when this piece was done. You probably do. Yeah, yeah, it might be. I think maybe late '90s. Um, but uh, yeah, what I think is important about this. I mean, Sagmeister. Um, you know, he always has such a flair for doing something magnificent. You know, it's um, it's something always very noticeable and something very striking. Um, and this, I think, is a good example. And I think um, what's I think pretty standard for him. Um, he does, you know, and sort of I always think about those lessons that we can learn besides doing like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to carve something in my skin? Um, besides the kind of basic design principle, like what, what else can we learn from this? And I think that Stefan Sagmeister has done so much um, about, you know, putting something of himself in his work. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something great to be said for that. You know, I think that, um, you know, Diane, you and I are both designers. If we were given the same project, you know, I hope that we would come up with two different solutions. And, and right. I think that that's great. You know, I shouldn't try to be like you and you shouldn't try to be like me. Like what we each have to offer is, is great and what we should be focusing on. And he, you know, said much, I think is sort of an extreme example of, or a dramatic example of, of that, of, of putting himself into the work to create something that's uniquely his and his perspective. Definitely. Always solving problems differently. Now, this is your work, right? Yes. All right. So, um, tell us a little bit first. How do you balance writing a book and doing your work? Because you still have to pay your bills. Because I know writing a book is not like a ton of money that people think it is. Because I work with art historians, and those image rights really cost a lot. Um, so, how do you balance that? Like, did you just work on Mondays on the book, or did you? You know, how did you balance it? It, it varied, um, and there were times when um, my I was crazy busy with my job while I still had you know deadlines to meet for this book, um, and it just you just have to kind of make it happen. I think what I got better at was um, you know just breaking it up. Like, okay, I can spend one hour on this. And then when the hour is done, I have to stop it for a while, and then I spend two hours on this. Um, I think that for me anyway, and, and maybe it's true for other designers, you you kind of keep working at something until it gets good and keep going and keep going, and I can't stop now because I'm getting somewhere. And I think that when you have a bunch of things going on, you have to split up your time and you have to be sometimes harsh about it. And, and I think that that can instead of just kind of focusing exclusively on one thing for so long where you think you're getting somewhere and maybe you're still getting somewhere, if you take a step away and then come back to it two hours later, you might have a fresher perspective or a new idea or you might see it and realize, like, oh, that's that's a ridiculous idea. I should, <laughs> I should do something else. Right. I wasted um, all my day doing this. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it was tough. It was, you know, there was, there was not much personal life. My family was um, very... Um, patient and kind, I think. Um, it was a lot of, you know, finishing up my work at 11 at night and then starting to write and doing that for a couple hours and then getting a little bit of sleep and then starting over again in the morning. Um, 
So but, block, blocking your time helped you and just setting limits and then knowing you could always go back and keep massaging it if you needed to, whether it was your pers your work for clients or if it was your book. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it helped. And, and you know, it's it, that doesn't always happen that way. And there were days where it's like, yeah, the writing just did not go well today. But, um, but overall, um, and I have found that that continues, though I'm not writing a book now, that continues um, to help me balance my projects now. Do you... Did they give you a time limit? Like, hey, John, you got to be done in, you know, two years. Or yeah. they, you're usually working on a contract, which is time-based at some point. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, it, um, yeah, I did have a, um, a, a deadline to meet and um, was told that if, um, if I didn't meet that, then I would be, I think, charged money or my editor would be charged money or something. Like, it's something that you, you have to meet. Um, they might give you a break one time but then not a second time <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully you didn't have any problems in that well tell us a little bit about because um, you have done some publication design and I'm just asking because I'm I also do publication design and it's I, it became a love for me I don't know if I started out in school thinking oh, I want to do magazine design or book design but it's really good for people who have just maybe a little bit OCD because we can maybe scan through something, we design it, and then we, oh, we kind of like, it's like a word find or a game to go back and find the mistakes or the errors. And you can always end up finding, even after it's printed, I'm sure you can always find things that, oh, I didn't catch that. But when did you fall in love with publication design? Um, I think I've always loved books, you know, since, since I was a kid. I think that... Um, when I was in design school, whenever we had a project that was um, book or book-like, I always really kind of dug into those and, and, and really loved them. And then um, my first design job out of school um, was great, was um, working for a small um, architectural book publisher. And it was so small that it was, you know, basically an editor and me. And so I was sort of the one person in the design department. So I was able to get right in there and, and, and design a book, which, um, which was a great experience. And I loved doing that. Um, and then went on to work in a couple of studios and, and now work for myself and always try to keep a book or two in the mix of the different kinds of things that I do just because um, it's fun. I, I love um, I love books and, and often I'm able to work on books where the topic, you know, I'm able to work on books on architecture or art or photography or something where um, I'm interested in the um, in the subject and I'm able to, to dig into it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the other projects um, that you've been able to work on, and one of them is uh, a project that you did for LL Bean. And I think some of the next images are are there, so I'll click through. But you want to talk about this one a little bit? Sure. Um, this was a book um, that was for the 100th anniversary of LL Bean. So um, I do find that um, history seems to be a, <laughs> a common thread running through my work. Um, uh, so this was um, being able to take, you know, these amazing things from their archives and put them together in a book, um, working closely with the editors to kind of form the, the content, um, helping, you know, helping art direct the photo shoots, like that example of, like, you know, shooting um, that shot, like at every, every chapter opener we were... Um, working on um, how do we show one kind of famous product that L.L. Bean has come up with. Um, and it was um, a lot of fun and, and a lot of different kinds of information. There would be, you know, it's it, it's a bit more magazine-y than um, kind of serious book in this case, I think, where it's, you know, there are sidebars and pull quotes and different ways to get different kinds of information. And I love being able to do that too. All right. What about, this is another spread or... Um... From it, right? Yes, that's also from the Bean Book. Yeah, so that's an example of like you know the uh, the sidebars, like little other kinds of information. Um, that's a little Bean by the numbers. <laughs> right. All right. So this one is another completely different project, I believe, and this is where you've done. 
and I just looked through your website, so you can give us way more. But you're doing a ton of environmental graphics. Um, this has been fun. The um, uh, this is in um, downtown Manhattan, the World Financial Center um, that I had done uh, some different work for, and this was a um, dance festival they were putting on. Um, and uh, we were able to do a lot of it's like big signs and banners, and you know that. What I love about a project like that is you kind of develop this, even though it, this was uh, something that you know it's this limited time frame of the, this festival happens over a couple of days and then it's all over. But you kind of develop this, you know, this like visual identity for it, and then you know, you can really dig in and make it like, okay, it needs to be a giant banner that all the people will see and it needs to play on these video screens throughout the complex. And we need ads running in the paper and we need um, lamppost signs outside on the streets and we need a brochure. So I love being able to, instead of doing sort of a one-off mm -hmm. project, like here's a brochure and then I'm, I'm done with that, that project and, and that client. Like I love it when you can really take this and sort of solve all the problems, like how can I make this thing work and have it be consistent among all these different ways it needs to be used, but have it, um, you know, where there's enough flexibility where it's, it's not limiting or, or boring. Definitely. And I also think having publication design in your past helps, I think it helps me when I have big projects because it's a lot about organization. It's also a lot about that visual identity that you're having to create, and you have to, it has to keep growing. And sometimes a book will continue to grow, or it'll have a second part, or something like that. And so that really is helpful. All right, so here's one of the next images, David Bowie. Yeah, this is a, um, a website for um, his management company. I believe his. I, I believe he's no longer part of that um, management company. But um, we designed a website for this uh, main road management, um, and they had some cool clients like David Bowie and David Byrne. Um, and so um, it's one of those like you know they had a really kind of 1996 looking website of just you know tiny little photos um, that looked very much like a template and um, we wanted to do something big and visual so we, each artist that's profiled we have a giant photo of them and have the you know text in a box on their face and just um, just make it much more visual and engaging and it was it was fun to work on still definitely using a grid you can go you can go back. Um, I know that you use a really nice grid on a lot of your designs, publication-wise, and I think I think that that's um, you can like the grid back in the '90s for web stuff was a lot of little images, and but this is a really nice piece, and it's definitely different than some of the other stuff that you've done. Yeah. All right. So now we're in advertising, right? Yeah, well, this was one of those, the project of, uh, this was a jewelry company called Miriam Haskell, and they came to me looking for a new brand. It had been around for, yeah, I think, almost 100 years. It was maybe 1923 or so that it started, um, and they had had kind of a, two different sort of random um, logos that they would use interchangeably and they needed somebody to kind of um, develop a, a better visual system for them. So um, so we came up with a new logo and just a new, you know, that kind of visual language or color palette type faces that um, worked with them and this was this was an ad. They had it's very kind of elaborate um, complex jewelry so um, we wanted to go um, pretty simple with the identity so it wouldn't compete and wouldn't be all this kind of craziness. You can see that's a necklace that's in that ad. Right. Um, I don't think you're, you're not wearing that necklace today, Diane. <laughs> I left it at home today. I <laughs> thought it would compete with my sweater. But yeah. one thing that's cool is that um, they're often tied. Oh, I can't even, but you know what the word I'm often Anyway, I, it just, I can say it in my head, but I can't hear it. <laughs> But they make it as certified authentic as a piece of, um, but this is part that you designed too. I guess this comes on the back of the um, box or something. Yeah, yeah. This would come with each piece, and it's the certificate of authenticity. authenticity. That's it. Yeah. I knew. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're still uh, made by hand in New York, um, every piece, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and very elaborate. So it was this kind of um, special 
uh, special company. We wanted to do some some special things and really kind of acknowledge the history. You know, I think that the what you're seeing there on that certificate, it's very classic looking. Um, but then, um, you know, we really kind of play with, you know, with that bright chartreuse color, you know, to give it a really um, modern feel as well. Right. And then there's one other piece from that. And so that, and this, it, I guess it's a photo, but it also, it looks like it's a spot varnish or something. I mean, again, I don't have it in my hands, but it has a really nice look. Yeah, that's the um, that's the press kit that we designed, and that's more just to show um, what the logo looks like. Um, so that's the logo, and the press kit was done. Our, our sort of color palette was this kind of metallic bronzy um, look, which which is the front cover of that, and then that really bright chartreuse was like a spot color inside. Um, so we really worked with those colors too, and I think they gave it sort of a neat, you know, it's metallics. You see a lot of silver and and um, you know. This just felt like it should be more um, bronzy. I think gave it a sort of its own its own feeling. Yeah, but then you've also done books, and this is a pretty big book. It's right. Yeah, this uh, and this book just came out. What was fun about this was I had um, um, designed this was a, it, this is a book about um, the public art program that's in the New York City subway system, um, and. Um, I had designed a book for this um, when I first started Think Studio, so that was maybe seven years ago, and the program has gotten much larger um, in the meantime, and so they wanted to do a new version of the book. Um, so was able to sort of revisit, you know, something I designed years ago and and freshen it up a bit and 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 use all these new projects. Um, what's on the cover there is. Even though it's you know um, it's called New York's Underground Art Museum, and you don't that doesn't look like it's underground, but that's the new um, transportation hub in Lower Manhattan, which has this incredible skylight, um, which was um, done by uh, uh, James Carpenter, um, and it's a pretty amazing piece. And you know you think of um, especially in New York, you know we're riding the subways all the time. It can be um, you know not the most pleasant experience. And and if you see, you know, they have um, pieces by Saul LeWitt and um, you know these other great artists that are throughout the subway. And so if you see that occasionally, it can kind of brighten your day. And I think that you know, especially that kind of dramatic skylight um, could definitely brighten your day when you're rushing to to get on your train. Definitely. And I think these are from some of the inside. Yes. Yeah. This is from the book. That and that's uh, Massimo Vignelli's, um subway map. Um, which was fun to use since I couldn't put them in my other book. I got them in this book. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, it was really clever how you did the table of contents, kind of using um, people who are from New York or who have traveled there a lot. They know that there's colors, and then it's each stop kind of, you know, and I thought that was really, really clever that you handled it like this. Was that you came to, with the um, writers and were like, hey, what about this? Um, it was more just um, I had done something similar but much simpler on the first book, um, and um, this one we just knew we had to do. Maybe we could do something similar, but it had to be fresher. And um, um, and this was incorporating all of the subway line colors um, and just keeping it, you know, keeping the stops, but but having that sort of. Um, rainbow of subway line colors in there was um, was pretty fun. Yeah, that's awesome. But you don't just do publication. You don't. And one thing that you're really great at is telling a story, whether it's in environmental graphics or like in the advertising piece. You're keeping the subject matter. You keep the star really in the forefront. But you've also done packaging, mm -hmm. which I love how they're cut off the on the side. The labels those are really nice. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's a um, uh, um, hair care company called um, Paul Lebrecht, and they have uh, um, some salons here in the city. And, and uh, a few years ago, it came out with some um, hair care um, products. Um, but it came um, uh, a few years ago. I used to work um, for Doyle Partners and um, did a lot of packaging there. We did a lot of packaging for Martha Stewart, so that gave me, I think, a lot of experience in how to package something and how to make it um, 
how to sell something on the shelf and um, and how to make it durable and how to make it look good. We we packaged the stuff that Martha Stewart sold at Kmart, um, which was, you know, at the time, the other stuff sold at Kmart was, you know, not very well designed. And, and then there was this kind of weird oasis of, nicely designed packaging for Martha Stewart um, and I think it was it was so great to be able to work at that scale and something that's so giant and so accessible to everybody but that you know we can still have good design at the mass level um, and, and I love that aspect of it. Definitely and then this is another piece from it again yeah. you're helping to choose probably color as well as um, you know the it's a, it, it really is minimal, but it's beautiful. Yeah, this was um, and this is Paula Breck again, and and um, you know that worked for them, and they had this sort of um, warm color palette, you know, where there are um, all their products are either um, well, there's white, and but then there's like you know brown and reds and oranges and and yellows. Um, so it was this kind of um, nice warm palette that was limited and just kept it um, very simple and sophisticated. So here's some more, not Paula Breck anymore, um, I don't believe. This is another web website, right? Yeah, this is another one of the, this is um, this is a music festival um, in downtown Manhattan that we did for two, two summers. Um, it's called the River to River Festival. Um, uh, it had been going on for a long time, and there is an, another um, design firm, Number 17, who, who designed their identity and, and worked with them for several years. And then they came to us for a couple of years, and, um, and what we kind of did was just sort of um, freshen the brand up a bit. The brand was there, and we sort of freshened it up. And um, um, it was really fun, and it, it's another one of those like where we were able to do everything. You know, there was this there's a website and there was a big program printed program guide and there were um, ads and time out in the village voice every week and there were um, banners on the stage and there there's um, Beth Orton performing and there are signs in the subway I love being able to get on the subway and see my work hanging up there it was was really cool yeah um, so so it was fun and and just an example of of that um, getting in there and, and all the different ways and making it work in all the different ways yeah, I think stuff like that, it, it, it's like a puzzle and you know there's more pieces or it can be a bigger puzzle and it's a nice, but that's where kind of publication design background, it's that organization that you really need and that really critical eye. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple more. Um, I really like how you kind of set this the smaller type in. There's just some nice small things that you're doing that are just really nice touches to to publication design. Oh, thanks. This was a book um, on um, engineering and architecture and how how um, engineering can inform um, architectural design. And um, it was a, a a really great book. And it's called Support and Resist. You know, which is what engineering does. And and so I really kind of was playing typographically with that. Um, you know, how are things supporting or how are different elements supporting or resisting each other? And, um, you know, there were some examples of some pieces in the book that you just think, like, how does that even stay up? And how is that, you know, how is that building standing? And um, and so I just wanted to play with that a little bit at work where there is um, some, some tension. Yeah. And this is the, the title page, maybe? Yeah, that's the title page of the same book. So there are some great photos. So is this the um, does this go? Is this something different, or does it go back to the dance? Uh, it's it's related. It's the same client, but it's a different program. They had um, um, this program of free arts and events that they would do um, throughout the year, and I I would do. Um, um, several, you know, each season there was a new poster and brochure and ads and. Um, video screens to do and um, so then I came up with like you know well what if you know it was all about you know music and dance and art and I thought like you know if we're so used to everybody seeing this on a printed page like wouldn't it be great if we could do an app that was um, 
you know, where you could hit a video of the Nutcracker in this case. Um, you could, if there was a, a musician, you know, we could hear their music. If it's um, an art exhibit, we could scroll, do a little slideshow of some of the work. Um, so that's what this um, this app was, was sort of taking that printed brochure and, and making it more interactive and bringing some life to it. That's cool. That was fun. And then this is... And this is that same project. This is a poster um, outside. It's um, uh, they would have to as set up the system where they they used to have something. You know, they would have a program for the summer and a program for the fall. And I would have something where it would um, set up a system where we kind of develop this consistent look of having a black and white image and then these really colorful. They insisted that all of their events are on the poster, which is a lot of information. So we just made it really colorful and we changed the color palette each season. Well, and it's also where you've placed it. So it has a it has a very active, you know, kind of still has kind of that interactive feel, I think. Yeah, yeah. So f last question. I know I'm going to share your links in just a minute, but what designer or designers do you think that you tend to go and reference over and over? Um, for inspiration or just to see how they did their work? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a really hard to answer. <laughs> I sort of, uh, like, everyone in my book. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Um, but I think that I, I turn to so many for inspiration in different ways, and it's not just about, like, how do I make something look like somebody else or how do I make something look good, but, you know, there can be inspiration for, um, you know, so like Herbert Beyer, who we looked at earlier, I think I'm also inspired that he evolved so much over his career. Like he mm -hmm. did so many different kinds of work, and and you know while he started at the Bauhaus and was a strict modernist, he loosened up a bit over time. And so I just love that idea that you know you can't. I don't think it's the smartest thing to have one idea or look or style, and that can we um, you know evolve as different projects require different solutions. Right. Definitely. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to share a couple of different ways for people to get in touch with you. And we're, um, uh, I'm going to have to click over to my email to get the Amazon link um, because it's too long for me to type. But you can get, get look at the Graphic Icons book at graphiciconsbook.com. And then you can also, and this is all coming in the chat, so you, they can just copy and paste right there. Let me type in... See, I have everything on this computer because that's the one I usually use the chat with, but it wasn't there today. But it's good to be flexible. you got to be able to roll with it, just like finding people, permissions. That's the problem-solving right. of a designer. <laughs> but I'm not good at talking and typing, so hopefully I'm getting it sp spelling everything, which I'm not that great of a speller. Book.com. All right, and then... I'll have to, and then at Twitter, are you on Instagram? I tried to find you, and I could not. I'm not on Instagram. Uh, should I? Yes. You yeah, should. okay. Because <laughs> um, there are some other John Cliffords, uh, but there's no Think Studio NYC, so I think you could still grab that one. Okay. Hopefully nobody will grab it in front of you, but you should. That's um, a big visual community, um, and I'm trying to write your um, Twitter there. Right? Is that right? Think Studio yeah, that right. NYC. Um, but yeah. Did you see the the? I'm sorry, the book website. You're missing an S between Ugh, icon icons. And books. Yeah. Yeah. Bookers. That's fine. Well, I'll, um. It's okay. I'm gonna put them after. Let me uh go grab um the Amazon book real quick. I think it'll be easier if I do it like this. But it's a great book, and I really like it as that kind of primer. And it's a good um, giving my students, I think, giving my students an insight and a, a beginning of what is such a great love of design history. So I think you did a great job. Oh, thank you so much. All right, let me grab that one now that I'm finally on Amazon. And there we go. I don't know if you gave me a special link, but I'm not sharing a special link. Sorry. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll have it on the site. It'll be underneath the video. And then um, 
yeah, Twitter, Think Studio NYC, and then hopefully soon on Instagram at Think Studio NYC. Yeah. That would be <laughs> terrific. But it's it's a it's a good good platform. I think you'll like it. Yes, I've heard great things. I, I just haven't done it yet, so I will. Okay. Well, good. Um, and you can also check you out on Dribble now, right? I, I haven't done it yet, but I will. Okay, but he'll be there. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, thanks so much. Um, I'm real excited. Next week we have Brooke Scherer, and she's going to be talking about sustainable design. And if you think sustainable design is just you can't deal with one other thing, you probably aren't going to be able to do it. She's going to explain it. So going to set us straight on some of the misconceptions as well as talk about some things that we can do in our design and, and as we design packaging and as we design all kinds of things to help um, the kind of paper we choose as and the kind of ink, the kind of marks we make. So I'm real excited to have her on. So if you're interested in sustainable design or you're not interested, you should still watch it because it will be helpful. But John, thank you so much. And I, since I can't, I'm not going to type my stuff in over there. If you want to get in touch with me, it's designrecharge.org. And you can always email me at diane at designrecharge.org. Just one in in Diane. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at, at Design Recharge, so it's pretty easy. Um, and that's it. So thanks so much, John. It was great having you on. I'm excited. You did a great job writing the book. I can't wait to see the next one that you do, that you write. Don't give up. I think you did great. <laughs> thanks so much, Diane. This was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me on. Sure. Well, and I'll see you all next week, uh, February 4th. I uh, can't believe January's already gone, so have a good end of January. Thanks again.